We have two best of Redditor updates, Reddit stories for you guys today. Starting off with my brother proposed to my fiance in parentheses, his ex, and I'm pissed. This one has a new update 10 months later. And then our second story is how to end it with a girl who has nothing going for her and will become homeless. This one has new updates. Alrighty, chat, let's get into these stories. My brother proposed to my fiance, his ex, and I'm pissed. Original post, September 8th, 2023. My 28 male brother, Mark, 26 male, used to date my fiance, Jen, 26 female, a year ago. For context, they dated back in August 2022. They were only together for a month before he broke things off with her because he was bored of being in a relationship and never really wanted to settle down anyways. At the time they were dating, I was in a different state, so I had no idea he even had a girlfriend, and I had no idea who Jen was until I met her. Her. Jen and I met at a bar when I moved back in October and hit it off really well. She was easily the most beautiful and intelligent woman I ever met, and we met up a few times more before we made it official. Fast forward to December, and I finally bring her up to my family and propose them meeting her at Christmas. They knew I was in a relationship, but I'm not the most open about my personal life, so I kept details about her to a minimum until I knew how serious we really were. My parents asked to see pictures, and they started passing my phone around the dinner table. Mark saw it and blew up calling me a shit brother for dating his ex-girlfriend, and he demanded I break it off with her. I refused. When I asked Jen about it, she confirmed they dated and gave me the details about their breakup. As improbable as it is, I can see how the family wouldn't know about him dating Jen and Jen being the person that he dated because it sounds like they're not close at all. But the fact that Jen didn't say anything to OP, like there's no way that didn't come up. Like, oh, hey, you have the same last name as my ex. I'm very sus about Jen. Like what are Jen's intentions here? Did Jen know that this is his brother? It took a few weeks, but eventually Mark stopped bringing up me dating his ex and I thought he was over it. On Jen's birthday this year, I took her out to a fancy dinner with both of our families and her closest friends and I asked her to marry me. Mark flipped once again and blew up about me proposing to her, which I and my sisters immediately shut down. The incident happened this past weekend. Mark had been pretty quiet about the whole thing for the last two months. I didn't see him much and figured he went low contact with me, which I had no problem with. Then, he invited me and Jen for family dinner at his apartment with my parents and sisters. I thought it was weird, but my parents and sisters were also going, so we agreed to go. The dinner was nice, nothing too fancy, and we moved to the living room to talk. About 30 minutes into normal conversation, Mark stood up and told us he had an announcement. He made a long speech about being happy to have his family around for his big moment, then got on one knee and pulled out this cheap ring while asking Jen to marry him. As toxic as that is, kind of fucking funny, bro. Like, <laughs> I don't know, man. The audacity, the balls to do something like that. This dead ass sounds like a YouTube prank. The Nelk boys are going to snag this and pull this as a prank because this is so fucking funny. Jen was confused and obviously uncomfortable and demanded that he put it away and stand up. My dad tried to make a grab for Mark, but I got to him first and punched him. I won't repeat most of it, mostly because I was too angry to even listen to most of it, but he said something along the lines of wanting to show me that Jen wasn't really into me and just wanted to get back at me. Before it could get worse, my parents rushed me out and promised to talk to him. It's been a few days since it happened and I'm still pissed off. I don't know what to do at this point. I'm scared Jen might have second thoughts marrying me because of this. Any advice? I can understand that maybe Jen is a little scared, but if anything, if she's a great girl, in a couple of years, this is going to be a crazy story that you tell your friends. The advice, the answer is pretty clear to me. It's just number one, have a conversation with Jen. Sit her down and be like, hey, I know that was weird. Like, talk to me how you're feeling about it. Let's make sure we're all good. If she has half a brain cell, she'll realize like, oh shit, this had nothing to do with OP. This was all just the egomaniac brother being upset and trying to ruin the relationship. Am I the huge fan of the fact that you dated and are now the fiance to your brother's ex? Not really, but also you guys weren't that close to begin with and it doesn't really even sound like he was that serious with this girl. So like, I don't know. I still think it might've been crossing lines, but with this family, I think anything's free game at this point. But yeah, talk to Jen, make sure she's all good and you guys are on the same page and then go no contact with the brother. And you should even tell your family, like you guys either go low or no contact with the brother. Cause like you just don't do that to family. That is a absolutely batshit thing 
thing to do to your family member. He doesn't actually want her. He's just upset because he doesn't want OP to have her like a toddler getting mad at someone for playing with their least favorite toy. I think if he was really a good brother, if he was really honestly like a good human, a good ex, like he would be over it and be like, I'm happy for you guys. Edit same post later that day. The only people I've spoken to since that dinner is Jen and my little sister. I want to clarify a few things that I saw in the comments. One, Jen and I are newly engaged. It was one of those feelings where we both knew we were in it for the long run. As fast as it is, I'm sure about her. Two, when we met, I was the one who approached her, not the other way around. Whether she knew or had suspicions of us being related, I don't know. I asked after finding out they dated and she says she had no idea. I didn't have a reason to doubt that, but I can admit this seemingly overreaction on Mark's part does raise red flags. How does it not come up? You have the same last name as my ex. Any relation? Like that, that shit would come up, bro. Maybe this is just me chat, but I feel like asking people if they have siblings, what their names are, pictures of them, like that's one of the first things you do, even within a month month of like dating someone. I think this is kind of fishy on her part. Three, I had no idea she and Mark dated when I met her. Mark and I aren't close at all. We used to be, but as we grew up, we drifted and talked less and less. Before I moved back, we didn't really speak much aside from special days like his or my birthday. Jen knew of my family, but not much until I decided I was ready to introduce them to her. When she and Mark met again, I didn't get a sense of any residual feelings on either part. She didn't treat him like a stranger, but she also wasn't overly affectionate with him either. Four, I was told this was a relationship that lasted a month. I didn't think I needed permission from Mark to ask her to marry me, but maybe that was wrong of me. I'm not sure. If there even should be permission there, I feel like if you have permission to date her, then obviously you have permission to marry them. That being said, I plan to talk to Mark this weekend to lay everything out on the table and figure out what's up. I never asked for his side of their relationship, which is my fault for not doing my due diligence. If anything major or enlightening happens, I'll update, but for now, that's all I have. Updated post, September 10th, 2023, two days later. I called Mark and asked him to meet up with me at my place to talk. I told him I would prefer Jen to be around for the talk as well, but I was cool with it if he didn't want her there. He agreed to talk to both of us and showed up at my place around noon today. It was pretty quiet for a few minutes before I started the conversation. I apologized for not warning him I would be proposing to Jen, and I apologized for hitting him. He said it was whatever, but he appreciated the apology. I told him what Jen had said about the relationship and breakup when I asked her about it, and I asked him to confirm if this was true. I pretty much said that his reaction through the whole thing has been extreme, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding their relationship or downplaying how serious they were. He confirmed that they only dated for a few weeks, and he broke up with her because he lost interest. Jen asked if he was acting like this because he still had feelings or regrets about ending things with her. He said he could admit he thought she was more attractive than when he last saw her, but there weren't any feelings or regrets. He said he just didn't like seeing a girl he dated, even if it was short term, with his older brother. And as a man, I shouldn't have violated him by pursuing things with his ex. Ah, uh, I see. So he sees her as property. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. All right. I reminded him that I had no idea they dated, so it wasn't like I consciously did this knowing their history together. He shrugged me off and said it didn't matter. I still should have broken it off. He was adamant that if the roles were reversed, he would have done the same thing, which I doubt. I asked him why he proposed to her if he didn't have any lingering feelings. Basically, to sum it up, he was talking about it to one of his buddies who was around when Mark and Jen dated. And the guy put the idea in his head that maybe Jen knew from the start that they were related and was doing this to get back at him, considering Jen had been hung up on him after they ended. He and his friend thought it would be a good idea to test it and see if they were right. So he came up with the idea to propose and see if she dumped me for him. I mean, sure, that would obtain the objective, but what a fucking nuclear option. Like, you could just talk to her on the side and see if her intentions are pure. I mean, even that would be fucked up, but so weird, man. So weird. Jen asked him to elaborate on why he thought she was hung up on him, and he told her that he heard she was asking about him following the breakup and still hanging out at the places they used to go to, so it was a valid assumption. Then, for her to pop up randomly with his brother, affirmed his suspicions. Jen told him she'd only asked about him once following the breakup, and she'd been hanging out at those places with friends before they started dating, and she wouldn't avoid them because of a breakup. She also told him she was offended at the idea that she would go as low as to pursue me just to get back at him. 
He shrugged and gave her a half-assed apology, but said she had to see it from his point of view. I mean, it sounds like he's just jumping to conclusions, which I feel like everybody does, but he jumped to conclusions and then took the most wild fucking actions of his entire life. Like, he could have just raised these suspicions with his brother, and that would have accomplished the same thing. The only difference is that his actions were selfishly just for himself. Did not care how it affected other people. He asked her if she really didn't know, and she told him that she didn't see the resemblance in us until we were in the same room and we act nothing alike so it never crossed her mind and he said okay that pretty much wrapped up the conversation he did tell me before he left that i could take back his invite to the wedding because he can't bring himself to support our relationship knowing he used to date her I told him he didn't have to worry about that as he was most likely going to be uninvited anyways. It's been a few hours since our talk and I do feel better. My parents aren't too happy about him being uninvited, but they understood that it was a mutual decision and probably for the best. My sisters told me they knew he didn't have a good reason for being an asshole and they don't blame me for not wanting him at the wedding. As of now, I'm going to limit contact with Mark and I doubt he'll reach out to me anytime soon either. The only relevant comment here is why didn't she know of your family? To which OP replied, we hadn't discussed my family much in the the beginning of our relationship, I left home to get away from them, my parents specifically, and started reconciling at my sister's request when I decided to move back home. I was open about not being close with them when Jen asked and she was okay with being left in the dark considering the circumstances. Okay, I guess that kind of explains it. I mean, you can be like, I'm not close with them, but here's my family. I don't know. I guess it, I guess it really depends. I guess there are people that I've gotten to know where I haven't like seen their siblings, but still the last name thing is getting to me. Like, so this is the second and third update, which was posted on November. November 11th, 2023. I've been low contact with Mark since our last conversation. I haven't called him and he hasn't called me. Our only interactions have been in family settings. As it stands, my mom is now upset that Mark is still uninvited for my wedding. It started with a comment made during my younger sister, Sophie, 22 female's birthday. Her boyfriend of, I think, four years was proposed to her at the end of the night and we sat around talking about what she envisioned for her dream wedding. She talked a bit about wanting a destination wedding and her ideas for the cake and dress. Then she said something along the lines of, Teddy, I know Mark's banned from your wedding, but you won't care if he comes to mine, right? I laughed it off and told her I can't get mad about her guest list even if I wanted to. My mom gave me this weird look and asked if Mark was still not invited to my wedding. I told her yes, and she got irritated. She told me she thought I was joking and said I was being unreasonable to go through with banning him from the wedding since he's family. She accused me of holding a grudge just to be petty. I reminded her that he and I agreed on him not coming. I then told her that this wasn't the time to talk about my wedding since the day was about Sophie and if Mark or her want to talk about my wedding, they can call me another time. Sophie laid into my mom a bit about trying to make her special day about Mark and my mom dropped the issue. For those of you who might be wondering, Mark wasn't at Sophie's party because he apparently had to work and couldn't make it. A few days later, my mom stopped by my house and said she wanted to discuss my wedding. She asked me why I was so adamant about Mark not coming to my wedding. She said that I shouldn't be so insecure about Mark and Jen's previous relationship and that uninviting him was a step too far. I told her that Mark and I mutually agreed on him not coming to the wedding and he can come to me about it himself if he has a problem with it. Yeah, what is this fucking mom's deal? Like, hey mom, I don't think you're hearing me. For the 400th time, we came to this decision together. Mark doesn't want to come to my wedding as much as I don't want him to come to the wedding. Like, uninvited isn't even a good word for it. It's just, he's not coming. Not only do I not want him there, but he doesn't want to be there. Why would I invite him? Stupid mom alert. We got into an argument and she said that if I wasn't going to reinvite Mark, then she would not be coming either because I'm ostracizing her son. I shrugged and told her if that's what she wants and she can toss her invite in the trash because I won't beg her to be there. She asked me if I would really be okay with her not attending and I told her it wouldn't be the first time she missed an event of mine because of Mark. Damn. That is an insane line. But also it sounds like she fucking deserved it, bro. She said I was being an a-hole for throwing her past mistakes in her face and she stormed out. I then started getting messages and phone calls from her and a few family members about the whole situation saying I was in the wrong and urging me to invite Mark just to keep the peace. Jen's also been getting messages from my mom asking her to talk to me and to get me to change my mind, but to my knowledge, she hasn't been responding. So far, most of my mom's side of the family are standing in solidarity with her and not attending, while my dad and his side of the family, which is only my aunt and uncle and their two kids, agree with me and are still coming. My sisters are also still coming to the wedding and of course, Jen's family too. Also, I talked to Mark about it and asked him if he had a problem with not having an invite. He said he uninvited himself in the first place and he doesn't get why they're making a big deal because he doesn't want to go. He told me to leave him out of the fighting because he's not involved and he says he'd tell her the same. As of now, I am back to being low contact with my mom, but my dad and I are still on decent terms. I'm still deciding on whether I'll reinvite my mom and her family should they change their mind about the boycott, but the chances are low and I told my dad this too, which he understands. 
For now, Jen and I started looking into downsizing the venue since the guest list is significantly smaller. It doesn't even sound like you uninvited your mom. It sounds like your mom uninvited herself. I would just leave that invite open until a certain date, like everybody's RSVP date, and just be like, you gotta decide. Like, you are invited, but you are the one who's uninviting yourself. And the entire family as well. Like, oh God, I am so thankful my family isn't this fucking stupid. Like, <laughs> Update three, my mom is uninvited from the wedding indefinitely. About two weeks after she decided to not come to the wedding, she stopped by and said she wanted to clear the air and talk about everything. We agreed and invited her in to join us for dinner. Jen made her a plate of food and I asked her if she was still planning on not coming to the wedding. She said that while she wants to, she can't get over me not inviting Mark because of a simple mistake. I reminded her that his simple mistake was proposing to my fiance with me sitting less than three feet away from him and she said it was just a joke. Jen asked her why she wanted to talk if she was maintaining the same stance on Mark coming to the wedding. She said she wanted to talk to Jen and she was hoping Jen would hear her out and talk me into inviting Mark again. She apparently assumed I was at work and she'd be able to catch her alone. Jen politely told her that she understood her thought process, but she wouldn't have had that conversation anyway without me present since this is about my brother. My mom made a comment somewhere along the lines of Jen being spineless and unable to have a conversation without me thinking for her, which started a pretty heated back and forth between the three of us before Jen told her to get out. She got up and started walking towards the door and my mom followed her, still screaming at her. By this point, she's yelling about her tearing our family apart. While Jen was unlocking the front door, my mom grabbed her hair and pulled her to the ground while still screaming screaming. She hit her and tried to claw her face and I dragged her off of her and threw her outside. Wow, just out of fucking left field. That's crazy. Assault over someone not being invited to a wedding is crazy. She banged on the door for a few minutes while I made sure Jen was okay before she left and called the both of us repeatedly. When I was sure Jen was okay, I texted my mom and told her not to bother reaching out again because we'll never speak to her again. I called my dad and sisters and told them what happened too. My dad was surprised and tried to make excuses saying she's been stressed out about this whole situation for a while. My sisters say they knew she'd snap eventually since she's always been a crazy bitch and they said they They'd come make sure Jen is okay. I asked Jen if she wanted to press charges, but she declined and said she only wanted to cut contact with her for good. I told her that part was obvious, but she should still talk to the police since she was physically assaulted, but she doesn't want my mom to get arrested. My sisters and Jen's mom came by to comfort her, thankfully, so she's doing okay. My mom is blocked on everything until Jen says otherwise. I genuinely don't know what to do now. Jen doesn't want to go to the police because she'd feel guilty having her arrested over this, but my sisters and I want to convince her to, and I'd at least want documentation in case something happens in the future. Chat, can you go to the police and not press charges? Because I think the documentation is, is really important in case this happens again. Like, this mom is clearly fucking crazy. If they need to file for, like, a restraining order or something like that in the future, this will come up. I think this mom does need to get arrested. This would be a great reality check for the mother. Not only does your son, whose fiance you just assaulted, want you to be arrested, but also the daughters, who has no skin in this game, are like, oh yeah, mom's crazy as fuck. She needs to be arrested. That is very telling to me. Relevant comments. All of this could have been avoided if Mark had sat down with your mom and taken responsibility. OP responded, he absolutely could, but I don't think he knows what accountability means. I really do believe he thinks he has nothing to do with our mom's actions, and I don't think anything I say will be enough to convince him that everything she does is for him and her own selfish gain. On November 12th, someone says that they should really press charges. OP responds with, Jen is still against formal charges, but after reading some of your comments with me and a long talk about how this could escalate, she agreed to have it documented with the police just in case. She wants to talk to my dad about possibly getting her back in therapy or some kind of treatment for her erratic behavior. And of course, we are moving forward with going no contact. Looks like OP made a clarification post on November 13th, 2023. The title, some background on my relationship with my parents. Like some of you said, Mark was the golden child. Mark was my mom's baby boy and she didn't do much to try and hide it. They didn't spend much time with my sisters and I like normal parents did with their kids unless they had to, but they'd spend time with Mark as often as possible, like taking him out shopping while we stayed with a sitter or bringing him home his favorite food and toys from the store when they'd shop alone. He usually got better things compared to the rest of us, like new expensive clothes while ours were thrifted, or new toys just for him compared to old toys we had to share with each other. If my sisters and I got gifts, they were for us to share, but my mom made it pretty clear that Mark's things were only for him and we shouldn't touch it. When Mark would screw up, I'd get punished for not being a good role model and showing him the proper way to behave. For example, Mark went through a phase of breaking his toys and I got the beating because obviously he learned that behavior from me. When he was eight, 
Mark got in trouble at school for trying to push a kid down the stairs. I was grounded for two weeks and told to apologize to the kid for not teaching my brother right. That doesn't sound real. That doesn't sound believable, bro. If that is real, like the fact that you still talk to your parents is a fucking miracle. When I turned 13, I pushed for my parents to start giving me an allowance. They agreed as long as I did household chores like mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, raking leaves, etc. It was usually somewhere around $25 a week to help me start saving. Mark saw that I was getting money and he begged my parents for an allowance too. Instead of making him work, $10 of my allowance money was given to him each week because we were doing such a good job with our chores that he never touched. Whenever I asked him to help, he'd tell me it's not his job to do chores, so why should he bother? It was around this time that I started really distancing myself from my brother. By the time I entered high school, we only talked to each other when we needed small favors or when we absolutely had to. I got my first job when I turned 17 because I wanted to finally get my own car and make money that they couldn't force me to give to Mark. My oldest sister, Maggie, helped me start my own bank account and showed me how to properly budget and save my money. I got my first car at 18 after all of my hard work. When Mark got his license, my parents asked me to let him use my car to get around and for extra practice behind the wheel. Reluctantly, I agreed and for a while the arrangement was fine. Mark used my car when I didn't need it and helped maintain it pretty well. When he expressed wanting my parents to buy him his own car, my mom came to me and told me to give him my car because he needed it more. When I refused, she threatened to kick me out. We got in a fight that night which ended with her giving Mark my car and taking me to transfer ownership of it to him within the following few days. Since I didn't have anywhere else I could go at the time, I just sucked it up and signed it over. I would have lit that car on fire before I gave it to him. If I was OP, I would have put off the title transfer as long as possible and tried to sell the car. Even if I sold the car for like half the price that I got it at, I would not give it to them. When I graduated high school, both my parents skipped my graduation because Mark didn't want to sit in a long ceremony just to see me get a piece of paper. And my mom didn't want to leave him alone for the night. So I only had the support of my sisters and my aunt and uncle who wanted to take me out. They ended up having to bring me home at my parents request because they made me dinner to make it up to me. It was a dinner I couldn't eat because my mom put shrimp and chicken on the same serving dish and I'm allergic to shellfish. My first year out of high school, I worked two jobs to buy myself another car and at the start of the new school year, I moved away for college and cut contact with them. They, mostly my mom, tried to reach out for the first few months via social media and Sophie, but I never responded and I told Sophie she would be cut off too if she kept trying. When she couldn't get me through Sophie, she tried going through my older sister Charlotte and a few times through Maggie and Mark until I threatened to file a restraining order for harassment. It was a bluff because I had no idea how to do it, but it managed to scare her off and the most I got from her was happy holiday texts over the years. Around the time I moved back, Charlotte told me they had been seeing a family therapist at Charlotte's request and my parents wanted to apologize for their treatment of us. I was hesitant, but I agreed as long as they would be genuine. And the reconciliation process started when I moved back home. That doesn't even scratch the surface of everything they put me through and it took a lot for me to even begin to let them back into my life. When I met Jen, I wasn't sure where my relationship with her was going or where my relationship with my parents was going. I didn't want to mention my family at all, mostly because I was ready to cut contact again if I needed to. Jen was understanding of being a sore subject and didn't press for more. I hope this helps shed some light on some of the questions I've been seeing pop up. It's almost too insane to not be real. Now it makes a little bit more sense about the girlfriend not hearing anything about the family. If anybody has a reason not to be in contact with their family, it would be this guy. Relevant comment on why OP didn't have reconciliation depend on them reimbursing him for his car. OP responded, eh, getting reimbursement for the car wasn't a hill I was willing to die on since the damage was already done. Even now it's hard to believe Mark was the favorite. There wasn't anything really special about him. I don't mean that as an insult either. He was just a regular kid. My parents weren't having fertility issues. He wasn't a miracle, wasn't a meal ticket. They weren't having marital problems and using a baby as a band-aid. He was just born and they decided to love him more than us. And believe me, my sisters didn't think this was normal. They just have a soft spot for our parents because they're our parents and they believe they have redeeming qualities. Update number four, November 30th, 2023, 17 days after the original post. To answer the most common question about why I chose to reconnect after everything, the short answer is because I would do anything for my sisters. Charlotte wanted the entire family around for the birth of her first child and to help her while she adjusts. She didn't want part-time aunts and uncles who would only visit her kid during birthdays and holidays. She was never the type to ask for much of anything growing up, so when she asked if I would be willing to try for her, I agreed because it would make her happy. I also think a part of me hoped that maybe they'd change. I don't regret trying to reconcile either, 
My parents are still terrible, but I met the love of my life, so I call it a win. A few people want to know if there's an update, so here we go. Sorry if it's a mess or confusing, a lot has happened. We filed a report with the police and were told that even though Jen doesn't want to pursue anything, it's not up to us to decide whether it goes further, but they would keep our preference in mind. We provided some pretty decent evidence of the assault, including pictures of Jen's face and texts with my mom and dad talking about what happened. We were advised to report and record any other incidents with my mom going further in case anything else happens. Considering where we live, I doubt it'll go anywhere, but at least we have it on record. I got about 100 angry text messages that tell me they at least spoke with her regarding the incident. My mom tried to corner me, leaving my job, and screamed at me about trying to ruin her life. She kept screaming that I was an awful son for trying to get her arrested over a small misunderstanding, and she didn't understand what she'd done to deserve being punished like this. I told her that if she didn't like being in legal trouble, then she shouldn't have hit Jen. She demanded I tell the police to forget the report, which I refused. I told her exactly what the officer said about it being out of my hands. She had a tantrum in the parking lot and hit me a few times, just on the chest and arm, before security intervened and dragged her off the property. I had to talk to my boss about the incident. Luckily, she was understanding of everything going on after I explained what was happening. When I got home, I told Jen what happened. She was upset and asked that we discuss the plan with my family moving forward. It was a long talk, but we took the advice of some of the Redditors and decided to go completely no contact with my family aside from my sisters. We agreed that having them in my life is adding unnecessary stress for the both of us and we aren't even married yet. She told me she wanted to consider moving away and putting some distance between us and my family. She said that she tried to stay out of my family issues because it's not her place, but she refuses to put up with my mom and her behavior or my dad enabling her abuse. A lot more was said, too much to put in this post, but I agreed with her that they were more trouble than they're worth, and I also don't want to put up with this anymore. I also agreed to go to therapy, and she's helping me find a therapist. Okay, all in all, net positive. I think all of this is the right move. I decided to call my dad after our talk and let him know I would be going no contact. He didn't didn't answer the first time I called, so I left a message asking to have a long talk. When he called back, he asked if it was okay for my mom to be a part of the conversation. I told him it was okay since she needed to hear what I had to say too. The conversation went about as well as you could expect. I told them both that Jen and I are cutting them out of our lives. My dad demanded to know why I would do something like that after going through all the trouble of repairing our relationship. I told him that this entire thing with Mark has shown me that nothing is actually repaired between us. As far as they're concerned, the world revolves around only my mom and my little brother. I told them that their continued favoritism of Mark has brought our relationship to a point of no return and that I wasn't interested in holding on to a failing relationship. I told them that I agreed to reconcile for Charlotte's sake, but I don't appreciate all of the disrespect towards me and Jen, and that I wouldn't put up with it anymore for the both of our sakes. To my mom specifically, I told her that I was tired of her using me as a scapegoat for her bad parenting and Mark's attitude. I also told her that I would never forgive her for what she did to Jen and what she did to me and my sisters growing up. She started to say how I should move on like my sisters have, but I cut her off and told her she should take their forgiveness and move on because she would never receive it from me especially after everything she's done these last few weeks. She started crying and asking me how I could treat her like such a villain. I told her she could only be upset with herself because I've done nothing wrong. She cried harder and told me how much she regretted having me and how I've only tried to ruin her life. Oh, wee woo, I'm the victim. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> this started a heated argument between her and Jen once again, and Jen told her in much more colorful words that she was disgusting and plenty of other nice names for saying something like that to me. I don't know if she left the room or just decided to shut up, but my mom stopped talking when Jen was done speaking to her. My dad said he wasn't okay with being shut out of my life, and he asked me to try to understand my mom's point of view. He said that she was also struggling because her kids were at odds and I was being unfair to punish her for her struggles with raising and caring for us. God, this has to be the dumbest fucking dad I've ever met. Bro has an excuse for everything. Raising children is hard. Hey man, don't have fucking kids. As fucking awful as the mom is, the dad would make me want to put my own head through a wall. The last thing he said was that we were a family and I shouldn't let past mistakes stop us from moving forward together. I told him that the only person she ever cared for was Mark and herself and there was nothing he could say or do to change my mind. I told him that it was up to him whether he kept my number, but I would be blocking him and my mom everywhere, and I wouldn't be reaching out again. Then I hung up. Afterward, I sent a long email with the links to my posts attached to my entire family, uninviting everyone except my aunt and uncle and my sisters to the wedding. I hadn't cried in a long time, but Jen held me while I cried after writing the email, and she assured me we would be okay. My sisters also reached out to me after reading the email. I apologized to Charlotte for not being able to continue reconciling like she wanted, but she told me it was okay and it's not my fault if I had to cut them off again. The response from my family has been pretty mixed. Some are angry that I aired out family issues on a public internet forum, while others are pissed at my parents because they never knew it was this bad. 
The last person I talked to about everything was Mark. He asked if I was cutting him off too, and I told him I wasn't, but I wouldn't be going out of my way to reach out to him either. He didn't argue and just wished me the best with the wedding, and we haven't spoken since. Interesting reaction by Mark. You think he'd be brainwashed by the mother to think the brother is evil, but he sounds very indifferent. Right now, Jen and I are looking for a new place to stay. The plan is to move closer to Jen's brother. He lives about three hours from where we are now, and Jen and I like the city he's in. I spoke to my boss about transferring, and Jen is looking into the option of working with 100% remotely or possibly finding a new job. And once again, our venues changed. Since the guest list is significantly smaller, my future brother-in-law is considering letting us use his lake house for our wedding. Relevant comments. Someone said your mom might try to figure out where you moved to. OP responded with, I'm already anticipating the aftermath of moving. She's going to follow us when we move because that's the kind of crazy she is. When she doesn't get her way, she becomes obsessive until she's forced to stop. I spoke with a lawyer friend of mine to see about a possible restraining order to stop her before she starts. Proactive. Active, we like to hear it. Uh, someone asked, did mom read the comments? According to Sophie, she's read a lot of them and doesn't think Reddit strangers have the right to tell her she's a bad person, LOL. I don't think there's any amending left in me. Wish them the best, just as far from me and my family as possible. Fifth and final newest update, September 29th, 2024, 10 months later. Starting it off with, I have a wife and newborn daughter now. We found out Jen was pregnant around the time of my last post, so that pretty much kicked us into overdrive as far as moving away and starting fresh in a new place. I was able to transfer to a different location, and Jen found a new job here that lets her work remotely. We got married four months ago at her brother's lake house. We didn't plan to have the ceremony so soon, but we both didn't want to wait for the baby to arrive to get married. Jen also found a dress that she fell in love with and didn't want to get too big to wear it. It was a small ceremony with mostly her family present, but my sisters, aunt, and uncle did it. Attend. I know some people probably wanted to hear about a huge blowout at my wedding, but it was easily one of the best days of my life. My daughter was born early last month. She's beautiful, happy, and healthy. Jen's also doing okay. The last stretch of the pregnancy was hard for her both emotionally and physically, but since giving birth, she's been doing better. She's seeing a doctor regularly during this postpartum phase due to complications she had during the pregnancy, but so far there isn't any major health concerns for her. Besides complaining about the doctor visits, I don't think I've seen a frown on her face since we brought our daughter home. As for my parents, I haven't heard from my dad, but my mom did reach out a few days after the wedding. Apparently, my uncle sent them some of the photos they took at the wedding. My mom made a fake Facebook page and started spamming Jen and I with angry messages about excluding her from both the wedding and from Jen's pregnancy. She went on a lengthy tirade about being entitled to being part of her grandchild's life and about how unfair it was that she wasn't allowed to be present in our lives. She asked to come visit us, demanded we visit her, and even asked to be in the delivery room, all of which was quickly shut down by me. I screenshot everything and emailed it to myself in case I need it for a PO in the future, then I blocked her. I haven't heard from her since, but I know she's been harassing my sisters to get us to talk to her. I don't know what, if anything, they're doing about it, but I did make it clear that we have nothing to talk about with her. For everyone wondering if Mark and I have been in contact, the answer is yes. He called after we came back from our honeymoon and congratulated us on the wedding and pregnancy. We did have a long talk about everything that happened. I won't go into detail, but we both got to say a lot and he did offer both me and Jen what feels like a sincere apology for what he did. We've been texting a bit here and there since we talked. It's mostly just small talk and life updates, but he did invite me to have a drink with him next time I'm in town. I don't know if I'll accept it, but I told him I'd think about it. Yeah, I think Mark has hope, you know, if he can come to the conclusion that like, oh shit, my parents kind of fucked me up. He did show little things of like, hey, maybe mistakes were made on my end. I don't know. It's 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 cool to hear this, but I agree with OP. He doesn't owe Mark anything. An added edit is just to clear it up before anyone asks. Mark doesn't know where I live and likely won't know in the future. If he chooses to give updates about my life to my parents, that's his choice. I won't give him any details that he can pass on that would help them pop up unannounced. Unfortunately, even if we are able to form some sort of relationship, I'll never be able to fully trust him. Chat, nothing like a Reddit story to make you thankful for your family. Part of the reason I like these Reddit stories is it gives you insights into like other people's messed up situations and like how they got there. And that for me is just a nice way to like avoid those types of things in the future. If I have kids, I never want my kids like this. I never want to have a golden child. I never want my kids to harbor any resentment for me. What a just mentally deranged set of parents. How to end it with 
with a girl who has nothing going for her and will become homeless. This one has new updates. Before we get into the last story, if you've gotten this far in the video, I'm guessing you're enjoying it. And if you want to enjoy all my future uploads, make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss any videos in the future. Also, if you'd like to be here live for those Reddit reads, go and check out my Twitch. Link should be in the description. I usually go live every Thursday and Sunday reading Reddit stories from MI the A-hole and best of Redditor updates. Join us for those lives and even get a chance to be featured in videos just like this one. Original post, July 27th, 2024. I'm male 24, met a girl, female 22, in a community college class when I was 20. We came from very different backgrounds. I was middle class, trying to find a cheaper way to go to college. She was living in almost poverty, going to school because she was forced to by her parents who were threatening to kick her out. She dropped out about a year into her schooling while I continued and finished. During her first year, we formed a relationship and she moved into my apartment, more or less. Her relationship with her parents is pretty much non-existent and she has little to no outside friends besides one or two women she knew from high school, who are deadbeats in my opinion. I make around 80000 a year, so we live relatively comfortably, but there's still some strain on finances. I can't exactly say when I started to lose feelings, but the fact that she refuses to work, will not cook, and wants to eat out every day, does not want to go to school, and continuously wants to buy and spend money on clothes and other stuff, just slowly started grading me more and more. I work in a female-dominated workplace and seeing, having conversations, and interacting with co-workers who have so much going for them, have fun hobbies and aspirations, makes it all the more worse when your girlfriend is chronically online and spends seven hours a day scrolling through Instagram or TikTok reels, and thinks having sex is all she needs to do on her end. Our relationship isn't bad. We have fights every now and then like an average couple, have an active sex life, but that's pretty much it. From her perspective, if I broke up with her, it would be out of nowhere, but I'm pretty much done and know I could move on quickly and have nothing to be regretful about as shitty as it sounds. The problem comes in her having no job, no finances, almost no friends, and no family support unit. I'm not a monster, I don't want to make someone virtually homeless, but I don't want to be stuck with someone who has nothing going for them either. I don't know what to do. Chat, I'm trying to decide if there's anything that OP has done wrong here. Because at no point in this post did he say that he had a conversation with her about this. It sounds like he's already lost feelings for her, so maybe there's just no possibility of this even working out. But I just feel like if you develop attraction for something specific and don't communicate it to your partner, I don't know. I just think that's doing the relationship a disservice. Maybe he has talked to her about it. Honestly, I, I feel like actually like I can't even make a verdict or give advice on this because I need to know how much he's communicated with her about this. If for months he's been like, hey, I'm starting to be more attracted to like aspirations. Like, what are you doing with your job? Even like, are you going to be a good stay at home mom where like you take care of the cooking, cleaning, whatever that looks like. I feel like if the communication isn't there, you're doing your relationship a disservice. But also that isn't necessarily necessarily his responsibility. It's nobody's responsibility to push somebody to have goals and aspirations. I don't, uh, if he's made up his mind and no matter what, he wants to break up with her. This might be a really shitty thing for me to say, but it's her fault that she doesn't have any legs to stand on. It's not like she's giving up her life for kids or anything like that. Like she made the foundation of not having anything to support her if she was by herself. She made that by herself. So I don't know. I mean, if you do break up with her, maybe provide some sort of support, like give her a month to go find a job or like figure out what she's doing or figure out if she can go live with a family member. But I also don't think that is your responsibility to prop her up when you know that you don't want a relationship with her. And I think it is her fault for not having friends she can fall on, not having family she can fall on, and not even just having like the possibility of a job. And I think giving her like a month, maybe two months is enough to be like, hey, you had the heads up, figure it out or you're getting the boot. But that also puts OP in a very uncomfortable position. Update number one, July 28th, 2024, the next day. When I made that post, I was having an extremely bad day and didn't expect it to blow up like it did, so I don't think I was able to give her a fair defense. When I had said that she had come from poverty, her father is a laborer while her mother also lives a similar lifestyle to how she lives now. Their home is maybe 1,100 square feet and in a terrible place in town, and given her father's past ultimatum, I don't think he will take her back as she hasn't been back home in years. Yes, I have talked to her about this 
since January maybe three times, either by gently telling her it would be nice if she went out more often to find a hobby, at the very least to flat out saying she was wasting away on her phone and that she needs to get a job or go back to school. Each time she either changed the subject, makes it a joke, or follows through for a couple of days before going back to her usual self. Okay, yeah, now that I know that he's communicated, that completely changes it. It makes me feel better to know that he actually did something instead of just like letting the problem build up to a point of no return. She is a kind partner who asks me about my day, always tries to make me laugh or lighten the mood when I get annoyed, and generally shows a lot of affection, which makes me feel terrible when none of that works anymore and I just see her as another person. Now, for the confrontation. Last night when we were both getting ready for bed, I didn't take my clothes off and instead just stood there telling her we needed to talk. At first, she was just smiling and jumping up and down on the bed with her knees, thinking I wasn't as serious as I was, but eventually she was able to read the mood. I told her something wasn't feeling right anymore, that I've tried to make this work and be patient with her for the past few years, but I didn't know how much more time I was willing to spend waiting for her to get a job, go back to school, or just get a hobby if anything. I told her that it annoyed and grated me that she just didn't seem to care about herself and that I hated she had no goals or aspirations. This was probably the first time in a long time she was as attentive as she's ever been during this conversation and agreed to whatever I was saying, even also giving suggestions on where she can apply, what courses were starting to interest her, and even said I could look over her as she submitted applications online to make sure she wasn't lying. In her head, it seemed like I was still willing to make this work, and a part of me believed this was finally the moment that she would change. So it made the next part even harder for me and for her. At first, I told her I didn't love her the same way, which slowly but eventually led me to saying I didn't feel anything at all about this relationship and was jaded. I was tired and wanted a fresh start with someone who was more goal oriented and I wanted something more out of life. When she realized what I was getting at, she started to cry and asked why I didn't mention this sooner. And I said, I've always asked her to cook, to go out with me to try something out or to just go back to school, even when I offered to pay for her classes anything. She said she understands that part, but she was upset why I didn't say it was leading me to losing interest in her, because from her perspective, it seemed as if I still loved her all the same. I mean, I get it that she wanted quote unquote the full context, but also I don't really agree with changing just because you won't have a sugar daddy anymore. You know, what he's saying is he wants somebody who would just change for themselves. And I don't think she's picking that up. I think she's like, oh, you just wanted me to be more ambitious. It's like, no, I wanted someone who wanted to be more ambitious for themselves themselves, not just because I'm threatening to pull the plug on this money tree. She started apologizing, saying she wasn't in the right mental state and saying nothing was motivating her. And she genuinely had no interest in any hobbies. The only thing she liked was spending time with me, which is all she looked forward to in the day when I came home. None of this was really affecting my emotions beside making me feel uncomfortable. So I tried to continue by saying, I think her lifestyle would be better with another person, but she immediately cut me off and became more panicked. She started to apologize again for what she's done and she would be a better girlfriend. That she would go with me tomorrow to wherever I wanted to go and would look for courses in August that she would start doing. But she did not want to lose me since she has nothing else in life and absolutely hated that I stopped loving her. There were so many tears and snot that I said we would have this conversation again when she calmed down and we eventually did in an hour or so. She pleaded to give her two more months to make a change and give her another chance and promised that she would change. Again, she listed off all the places she would apply to and said she would be a better partner. I never wanted to make her homeless, so this seemed like a good settlement, even though I still had my doubts. I then reaffirmed that I wanted to see other people, but she seemed much more adamant on this issue than the aspirations issue that she would be able to fix this. She said just give her a month to try and make the relationship work and ask me again and again on what she could do to make me love her again and that she didn't want me to hate her. She said that this was the worst part of it all, the only person that she had just being done. It seemed as if she was about to break down again, so I said, okay, we'll see how this relationship is in a month. In my mind, if I'm allowing her two months to get back on her feet, then by a month, she would already be ready to move on. I also didn't want her to suffer a complete mental breakdown while I was still living with her. So giving her a month, let her fix the relationship would give her enough time to accept things. I slept on the couch last night and will probably continue doing so for a while. She came out at about 3 a.m. wanting to talk some more, but I said I was exhausted and we would do it tomorrow. She then slept on the floor beside me for the rest of the night, apologizing again. When I told her to stop, she silently said okay and sobbed for a bit under her blanket. But that's everything that's happened so far. This was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, but I regret nothing and I feel much better letting everything out. I don't know how the situation will be in two months, but I was firm that it was the deadline. This post will probably get buried, so I probably won't do another update since I don't think anyone will care about this in a week or a month, but I will definitely private message those of you who've been helping me through this on how it turns out or those who just want to be updated. 
But yeah, thanks. Edit for all of you who keep asking what my workplace is. I'm an RN. This is just messy. I'm glad OP is kind of giving her some time to figure her stuff out, but he's also lying to her about her chances of actually fixing the relationship. He's not just straight up like, this will not be fixed. I'm giving you a month to figure out how you're going to live without me. Because in her head, it's, I have a month to get OP to still be in love with me. I don't know how I feel about that. That part feels weird, but also this is just such an awful situation to be in. Update. 3, August 3rd, 2024, one week from the original post. After the night confrontation, we didn't really speak all too much at home, with it being dry and awkward for a day or two, but I have been told I'm a workaholic by nature, so it was easy for me to stay at the hospital as a distraction. But in that time, she did start to cook again. We weren't in the mood to go out to eat together. Eventually, though, I sat down with her after she asked for a more thorough conversation on why I felt our relationship was failing. She promised not to cry or to get upset, but she wanted me to be 100% upfront so she had a better way of understanding and stating she wanted to try everything to fix this. I was really apprehensive about this and I can't really explain why, but given being together for four years, I wanted to at least make an effort myself out of respect, even though a large part of me was angry for even doing so as I feel I've never had the same from her. There have been many different camps in my last update, the main ones being kicking her out immediately and leave her before it gets worse try to find a way to fix our relationship or end the relationship altogether, but continue living with someone who would probably become absolutely neurotic. If I was going to let her stay for two months, I would absolutely not be dealing with that. I took consideration in all these main advice discussions and read through almost every reply, even the most assumptive, bizarre, and downright unhinged Redditor takes. More importantly, I took heavy influence of those who have shared with me their past stories, which either led them to being stuck in loveless relationships for years, or eventually being able to overcome their problems and have an even stronger connection. Thank you again for private messages. I read through a lot of your lives. Now, for our conversation. She said she saw something on TikTok where couples put a phone on the table with a timer and wanted to do something similar for each person to air what made them upset. I said that was dumb. If we were going to talk about our problems, it would be better if there was no time limit. She eventually agreed and said I could go first, asking me first, when was the time that I completely lost my love in her? As I said before, it was never one action, but a grating feeling that got worse and worse until it got to this point, and I told her that. She then asked, when was the time I felt the most angry? I said it would take some time to think for me, and she said that was fine. After a few minutes, something came to mind. I couldn't formulate the right words at first, but it eventually just started to come out. I told her the worst time was when I was first starting at my hospital. To keep it short, the tempo was brutal. It was constant work with little to no downtime as I was constantly learning new things that school would have never taught me, which being expected to be able to handle it as a professional, it was without a doubt the most stressed I've ever been, and I feel like other RNs can relate here. That year hardened the way I think now that hard work does pay off if you have the drive and the passion. I told her I think that was when I started losing feelings the fastest, seeing her at home doing absolutely nothing, coming home to no food made, to her not working a job, to her not learning anything, completely stuck to the internet with nothing to show for it. I said it made me even more upset when I had given suggestions for jobs with pretty easy schedules or to find a new interest in school that would pan out better than last time, only to be rejected at my every attempt. I told her flat out that it disgusted me. She asked me why I didn't make this a bigger issue at the time, that I should have communicated this to her, but I said there's some things that shouldn't have to be said. I shouldn't have to remind her to wash her ass, eat, do something other than mindlessly scrolling on her phone for hours at a day, every day. Here's the thing, chat. I don't necessarily disagree with this. Is it your job to tell someone to wipe their ass? No, but if you notice that your partner isn't wiping their ass out of anybody, it should be you that's telling them to do so. Yes, it's not your responsibility, but I think you should have communicated if he had known. I think this is probably just something where one day he just realized like all these things had built up and he's like, holy shit, I don't have feelings for this person anymore. And he's actively communicating that now. But I do think if you are in touch with your feelings enough to know, hey, if this continues, I'm going to lose the feelings that I have for you. I think it actually is your responsibility. It is your responsibility to tell your partner, hey man, you need to wash your ass. If you don't go and find this job or like figure out your life, I see a scenario where I will lose attraction to you. I also told her that after coming 
coming home from the hospital during more stressful days, the last thing I wanted was to spend my time begging my girlfriend to do something productive. So I held my tongue and settled as she was still nice and caring. I had no other reasons to end it. And so the resentment grew worse from then on. To my regret, it was around here that I became more mean, but I will still input it as I have everything else. I told her that when she dropped nursing, I was upset since I felt like she was more than capable of doing what I had done. But after spending more time in the relationship and spending more time getting to know her, I knew that with the type of person she was, there was no way she could have ever finished. Damn, bro. That is a little unnecessary. That's a little kicking her while she's down. Which is why I suggested easier and more laid back jobs, less demanding majors for school. Shit, even if she just cooked or found an interesting hobby, at that point, I would have appreciated it. Still, she chose to do nothing for years. It's just the type of person she was and why I felt done for her romantically over time. She asked me if I hated her and I said I didn't know. I told her she was very loving and kind, but I hated how she handled her life to this point that I felt no ill will towards her after airing everything out, but I also felt nothing else. I just felt done and ready to move on. Throughout this conversation, we kept eye contact and there were times it seems like she would break, but like she said, she remained as calm as she could while I said what I had to say. I told her I was done and she could say her piece now, but she asked if we could continue the conversation later and locked herself in our room for the rest of the day. The next day we sat down again and finished the conversation. She told me that she thinks she's depressed, saying that she didn't feel sad before that night, just had no motivation of doing anything. I had a couple of messages telling me to get her tested for ADHD, but when I started bringing it up, she was very adamant that this is not something she felt comfortable with. I knew she didn't like needles or going to the hospital in general, but her flat out refusing to get tested for disorders when I told her it was not at all like a regular hospital visit surprised me. She asked me if she was able to change in her behaviors, would I give her another chance? I said I didn't know, as I felt nothing now and didn't know if her doing it would bring any feeling back especially since it took my breaking point to do so. She asked if there was any compromise and I told her again, if in a month I felt like there was enough reason to stay together, I would, but that there was no guarantee that my feelings would return, but I would match any effort she also put out. She was frustrated by my answer, but I said that's how it would be. She gave me a piece of paper to look at that she was working on last night that had a list of hobbies and interests she wanted to look into, the major two ones being photography and cooking again. She told me that she was looking into these while also showing me her phone giving proof that she was putting in applications on Indeed and Glassdoor for some entry level positions that she might get hired in. I told her if she was able to show enough passion or interest in these hobbies that she showed, I would not care about her working, just anything to improve herself. But if she didn't do anything at all, then it would be best to look for a new job to help her if she moves out. I've also been asked in private messages if I have any personal friends to talk to. There's two female coworkers I confide some information in, given how many hours we work together at our hospital and who I completely trust as in my opinion they are extremely grounded they both said i would eventually get love bombed and this would all go back to how it once was and that i needed to stand firm with moving on they're very helpful friends who have even offered to let me stay over a few nights giving the reason that i would fall for her manipulation if i continued being anywhere near her in their own words but it didn't feel right since i'm still technically in a relationship but i said i would consider it if the situation worsened but again i find them grounded so i always try to take their advice to heart Despite numerous messages from you all privately or openly telling me that this will be a mistake, I want to make the attempts to give this one last try, though I feel heavily closed and guarded and still feel indifferent with our current situation. But a lot of you have told me this can eventually change with enough work from both parties. I have also taken the advice of those saying to cut off sex, which was my intention from the start anyways, by continuing to sleep in the living room. But each day she has been sleeping on the floor right below me, even when I tell her I'd rather be alone with my thoughts, telling me this is something she would not accept. That's a red flag to me. If she was really in it and also just respectful of OP in general, she would respect his boundary of that and sleep in their bedroom. I'm trying to think, chat. If you are in a relationship with someone and there is something they're doing that you know for a fact will bring the relationship to a point where it will end, don't you agree that you should then communicate to that person that whatever they're doing could end your relationship as soon as you know it? For me, the answer is yes. Like whether that's, hey, the way you interact with other women or talk to me in front of your friends, like whatever that is in a normal relationship, it is expected to communicate, hey, I don't like this. This needs to change or the relationship will end. Per how a relationship is supposed to work, I do think the girlfriend deserves the opportunity to at least 
fix the problem. As much as he was making the arguments that like, hey, you shouldn't have to tell someone to wipe their ass. You could probably say that about any relationship problem. I shouldn't have to tell you not to flirt with other girls. I shouldn't have to tell you not to talk to me the way you talk to me in front of your friends. Like that's kind of how a relationship works is like, you're going to do stuff that makes each other mad. And it is your responsibility, no matter the topic, to have those conversations with that person. I don't know. I think the big difference here though, is that he has kind of completely lost feelings. I don't even know if victim blames the right way to put it, but I do think it is a little bit of a fault that it took him getting to the point of completely losing feelings to finally realize that this was breakup worthy for him. Update four, which is the first of the new updates, comes in on August 19th, 2024, 16 days later, three weeks from OG post. Title of it is first week. My girlfriend was very proactive last week. It was a manic influx of energy as she tried to get interested in many different things that she thought she could enjoy. I kept my promise in meeting her halfway and tried my best at helping her in whatever way I could. The only real interest that she's been mainly sticking with is photography. I've said before that she has a stockpile of clothes that she's had over the years, and she sold a few of them on Depop in order to get enough money to get a Canon 250D camera that she says is good for starting out. She's looked a lot more into this than me. Okay, that that's a good start. I strongly assume she stuck with this hobby as it gave her a chance to spend more time with me as she continued asking me to go out into the city to take pictures and test out her camera. Given that I had promised to match her energy and didn't want to be a hypocrite, I did so even when I came home from longer shifts at the hospital. There was a major change in her behavior, however. While she was usually a very loving, affectionate partner, it had been turned up to its max during the first week. She asked me maybe eight times a day how I was doing, if I was upset, what I wanted to do for the rest of the day, etc. Just trying to gauge my mood. When we went out, her PDA was also maxed. She wanted to kiss, hold hands, and spend nights out as long as possible even when I said I had to go in early to work the next day. It's hard to describe in words what she was doing. I don't know if it was exactly love bombing, but with the energy she was putting out, I was fully expecting a crash to come, and it did during the second week. I'll talk about that in another post. There was only so much I could handle before I needed a break, especially with how I was still feeling after everything that had happened prior. My friends at work are the only other people I have been engaging with and I've told them everything that has happened. They warned me again that I was getting love bombed like they predicted and it would only get worse. They asked me what I would do if I was stuck with her longer than two months and I said my lease would be ending soon so it was helping me ease my mind as I wouldn't mind moving if this all turned out for the worst while still giving her enough time of a heads up. They stated their concerns that I was coming to work more tired than usual and it was getting noticeable but I told them that I felt fine. During the weekend they had insisted that I go out with them to help my mood. Still stating that too much time at my apartment was not good for my health in my current situation. I declined when first offered, but after being asked again the day of, I agreed, and for most of the day, I was with them having a really good time. In fact, it helped to regain my mood considerably. Naturally, my girlfriend was wondering where I'd been the entire day, but I told her I'd been with friends, and even though she was disappointed, we couldn't go out for the day. I promised her we would spend all day tomorrow together. As much as I do think, hey, if you're feeling this out, you should spend time with your girlfriend, you also need to equally be spending time in a way that feels like you don't have a girlfriend. Cause you, you wanna compare and contrast. Like if you're with these friends and you're having a good time and you also maybe realize, hey, like I don't feel like my energy's drained. I don't feel anxious right now. I think that could be telling of whether or not you think this relationship should still keep going. I get continued messages that I should immediately drop my friends and that they are manipulating me in my decisions and think what you may i know they are good people who look out for me they played a large part in me quitting smoking this year which although has made me more anxious at times has helped with my health considerably there's a different type of bond you form with people in our work environment and i trust my co-workers with my life for a lack of better term anyway that's most of what happened the first week putting everything for the second week would triple this post and it's hard looking back on it as it happened so recently and I still feel heavily raw. Large part of me posting this update is to help, as writing everything out has always been a therapy for me. It doesn't really look like he did write out week two though, cause then it jumps update post five, September 26, 2024, five weeks later, two months from the original post. Now that over a month has passed, I think now is the best time to reflect. There might be parts in this post that don't make much sense chronologically, but given that I've been writing and taking breaks over multiple attempts, some past tense might be off as to where I began and left off. When I said the crash of emotions would come, I was right. It was ugly, 
loud and could have been easily prevented in parts. When I posted my last update, I was not in the right mental state, so reflecting on the week before and writing helped to calm my nerves. I'm also a bit embarrassed to admit that I started to smoke a bit again, but it also helped tremendously in my mental, which was getting close to crash as of recent and without the help of my friends, I didn't have much else to turn to. This breakdown was something I could not tell them since I didn't want them stepping in. There had been a point where my girlfriend was in a not so well mood during one of our outings to the city. After returning home, she had said I was being dismissive and if I felt angry or upset with her. Trying to be better with communicating, I said I was getting uncomfortable with her constant need of affirmation and affection, as it was continually constant. Given that she was still sleeping in the living room at night, I was getting no time alone to myself at all while at home, and after so many outings, I was starting to get physically and emotionally drained. Truthfully, I felt physically tired more than anything. And given what my coworkers and my girlfriend said, it tends to show on my face more worse than it is. My girlfriend seemed to take this heavily and didn't attempt to talk with me for the remainder of the day, along with the next, but was in a much more brooding mood during the second. Maybe it would have been better to apologize or communicate better during that point, as it might have been the point that a lot of this could have been avoided if I said something, but I instead took the time to nap and spend time alone, which I had rarely the chance to for over a week. Then came the third day. A lot happened over the course of this day, and a lot was said, and this was where the breaking point occurred, which caused further problems throughout the following week. When I woke up, I had left without saying goodbye or speaking to my girlfriend as I was almost running late. Normally, I at least check on her to see what she's doing before I leave. She had been sleeping in our room for the last few days since her mood dropped. My mood was higher than usual during work as I was rested had my alone time, and was just genuinely having a nice time at the hospital, which didn't happen too often. There were a few times when my coworkers would go out to eat after work, and for the past few weeks, I had been declining. But on this given day, I had joined them, which led to me arriving home around 9 or later. It was pretty late, and I had a few drinks. This was where I begin to have trouble writing, and where I usually stop. Arriving home, I see my girlfriend sitting down in the living room, looking at me directly as I walk in, not saying a word. It startled me, and I asked what she had been doing, as she wasn't on her phone, nor was she watching TV, just sitting as if she was staring at a wall before I had entered. She asked me where I had been, and I said I was out with friends. She immediately asked, were they my friends from work? My girlfriend is aware that I work alongside mostly women, and I have brought up my friends in the past before our relationship broke down to this point. I said yes, I was with them, and we had gone out to eat. She asked me if I had been drinking as well. I don't know if it was noticeable or not, or just a random question, but I said that I had. There was a period of uncomfortable silence that felt a lot longer in memory. She eventually brought up my month deadline on whether my feelings would change, and she asked if they have. It took me a minute to reply as that question had taken me off guard, and I said I appreciated her efforts and what she was doing, but I was still unsure of our future together and couldn't give her a direct answer. She told me again that during our outings together that I was being dismissive, and that she felt I wasn't putting in the same effort to make this relationship work. I asked what she meant, as I was going out with her whenever she asked and matching her effort in finding hobbies whenever she thought of something she enjoyed. To me, it just seemed like something she was just saying out of neediness. I mean, most of it too is like, bro kind of already made up his decision. Like, whether consciously or subconsciously, he probably is just on autopilot right now. And it also sounds like he is emotionally drained, if not physically as well, which is going to play into how he acts around this woman. I think it was at this point she started to lose her composure, as her voice couldn't remain constant. She told me if I was aware that I wasn't smiling when we were outside, that I was quiet, and rarely talked when we were spending time together. I told her she already knew how I felt, so for some of it, my mixed feelings shouldn't come as a surprise. But I also explained again my lack of talking was just from being tired from work, but I don't think she believed me. She told me she's constantly overthinking how I feel now and she knows I've lost feelings, and doesn't know what she can do to make them come back. I told her again to just find a passion for something, anything, to get out of bed and be active with anything in her life. She says it's been two weeks and she's been as active as she possibly can be to the point that it was causing her mental stress, but my mood wasn't improving and she's wondering if anything will actually change now that it's closer to a month. And then came the full breakdown. Through tears and a broken voice, she tells me how much she loves me, how much affection and love she has given me throughout this relationship, 
just for me to throw it away over something as stupid as my conditions, as if it was just an excuse to end things, if I ever really loved her at all while we were together. This is just a really stupid and invalidating statement. She's basically saying, the way you feel is stupid. You should just not feel that way. She goes on to say that even with how upset she is at me and how hurt and betrayed she has felt by the one person she has, that she still loves me and wants to continue our relationship. She tells me there will be nothing for her if I leave, no one, no place, no future. Her will to live will be gone and she won't know what to do with herself. There's the manipulation chat. Hey, if you leave me, I'll probably KMS. Now there's a lot I could have said during this, but I don't think I can accurately convey just how hard she was breaking down emotionally during this exchange. There were points as to where she was almost screaming, completely bawling, and it all just made me freeze, as this was the first time I've ever witnessed her fall apart at this level. She goes on again to say there's no reason to live if this is the end, it won't matter what job she gets, another month will not be enough, and she knows I still won't want to be with her, and that she will have nothing. After everything was said, she locked herself again in our room and stayed there for a few more days. Whenever I tried to knock to initiate conversation, she screamed for me to go away, and I did. A few days later, she finally calmed down enough to where we could speak to each other, and she changed her attitude 180. She was still upset, but extremely apologetic in what she did and said, telling me that a lot of it was just in the moment and she didn't mean it. Chat, is that bipolar? That 180 goes crazy, bro. Like, if you're going to present the hill that is invalidating their feelings and blaming them and using the, if you break up with me, I'll unalive myself tactic, you better die on that hill, bro. The days that I was finally able to spend alone without her or my friends gave me the to finally do what I should have done a month ago. I told her as gently and as calmly as I could that it was over, that there was no chance we could be together at this point and I no longer wanted to be in a relationship. I told her I would let her stay for an additional two months until she could find a job and help her get on her feet. I also said that if she was unable to do anything by that time, then I would be gone and moved out. She started to cry again, but in a much more defeated manner that almost made me break myself, but she agreed to the terms and it was finally done. She was able to get a job at a supermarket about a week afterwards, but only part-time at first, as that was all they were offering. After our final confrontation, our speaking terms were more or less dead. Whenever she was off work, she would be in her room alone for the remainder of the day and night. I had stayed on the couch at this point, I was pretty much used to it and didn't really mind it. It feels really wrong and selfish to say, but I felt extremely free and happy for a bit. I didn't inform my coworkers about my breakup when it happened and just continued to vaguely say that we were working on it, but during that time, I frequently started going out a lot more with them after work, as staying in our apartment felt more like a chore and depressing. I had hit a high that I had not felt in a long while, and then everything came crashing on me the following week. I had contracted pneumonia and was off work for about two weeks to recover. At first I thought I had caught a cold, but one day it hit like a brick and my lungs felt at 50% capacity. I couldn't take a deep breath without going into a fit of coughing and I constantly felt fatigue. Even now as I write this update, with most of my symptoms gone, I still have to use an inhaler to help myself breathe at times. For most of the days that I had been sick, I was sleeping, most days between 12 to 14 hours, and the time that I was awake, I was lying down. When I told her what I had contracted, she saw how sick I was and she offered to let me have the bedroom again, but I refused and said that I was fine. Since she was working part-time, there was still a lot of time that she was spending at home, and for the first few days, she left me alone. But towards the middle of the first week I was sick, she started to occasionally check on me to see if I was okay, and if I wanted anything to eat. Honestly, I hated that me being sick forced us to interact, not because I was mad or anything, but because it felt incredibly weird and awkward, and that I had to depend on her now for a few things not even a week after we had broken up. I didn't feel well enough to get groceries like I normally did, and since she already worked at a supermarket, she insisted that she buy food instead, and when I gave her my card, she refused it, and said she would buy it herself. For the most part, I was snacking on fruit and cookies, but she said if I was going to get better that I eat actual meals, so she began to cook for me even when I said I didn't want anything. Even with this, we didn't eat together for the first week as she went back to her room after checking on me. I see what's happening here, chat. Uh, she's she's kind of wiggling in, but honestly, this is what she should have been doing from the start. Acting not codependent and doing things independently, almost like playing hard to get. I think this is what she should have been doing from the start. I really hope this isn't going where I think it's going. But during the start of the second week of me being home, she started to sit down with me while I was awake and talk with me. She told me about her day at work and her coworkers and a bunch of other stuff. It felt like a lot of it were things she wanted to tell me earlier, but couldn't because everything was still raw. But when she started to talk, she didn't stop. And honestly, I enjoyed listening to her talk about her day because it felt different. It went from talking to us watching TV together during nights that I couldn't fall asleep, 
to us just talking about our issues that we've been holding to ourselves for a while. It was extremely cathartic and there was no yelling or arguing, just listening. It felt a way that we hadn't talked in a long time, not since before we got together years ago when we were friends and classmates. Sometime during the second week, I had hit a point where I felt extremely ill and I didn't want to talk or do anything, but I couldn't sleep either because I kept on coughing. She didn't go to work that day and stayed beside me for a long while. We didn't talk at all, but she made sure I was still eating and drinking water. There's a lot that could be said about how those two weeks made me feel about my situation with her and everything that had happened, but I can't convey them in words, much less writing. But I'll say it was a lot of time to think. Since I've recovered, I've been trying to make a bigger effort to talk with her, but at the same time, not trying to make it feel forced as it may have felt a month ago. Just random conversations about random things, about how her photos were going, how work was going, if she liked her boss, just whatever. She spent less time in her room and more time in the living room with me when I had gotten home, just talking about her day and work, customers and coworkers, and in turn, I told her about my day. Gradually, within these weeks, it felt as if the transition of being in a relationship to being friends is a lot more apparent. And it feels better and more organic this way as it's become easier to communicate. Oh, thank God, bro. I, I dead ass thought this was going a different way. Bro baited us in hard. I, I was like, oh no. Oh no, step bro. Don't do it. Even still though, there's a barrier between us, something that formed from our final argument and it's hard to describe exactly what it is, but it's there. The deadline that I'd formed for me moving out is at the end of October, as that's when my lease ends. I'll post another update around that time. This post has turned a lot longer than I thought, but it's nice looking back on everything and seeing how our situation has been changing for the better. If you're still around reading this, thanks for the continued messages regarding my situation. Sorry if I couldn't reply in the meantime. I don't know, chat. An entire month is a long time for something else to happen, bro. I hope he doesn't bounce back, because I think this is just a move on situation. He doesn't sound like someone who can be very confident in his feelings. He seems like somebody who is very aloof until he's like at the peak of that feeling. Because that's what happened. That's why we're here is because he could not figure out that her being unmotivated was enough for them to break up until he literally wanted to break up. I feel like this is going where like, you know, we're just friends, we're just friends, we're just friends. And then all of a sudden one day he's going to be like, oh shit, maybe I have feelings for her again. That's where I feel like this is going.